McElhaney Lecture is funded through the Franklin Electric Company. And before we go any further, I would like to introduce Tammy Davis of Franklin Electric, who will start the program and the introduction of this year's lecture. Tammy. One wanted to confuse the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Yeah, it'll work out. I am uh, Director of Marketing Services for Franklin Electric, and it is our privilege to have sponsored the McElhenney Lecture Series for the last uh, two years, going into our third year now. And before I introduce our 2008 McElhenney Distinguished Lecturer, I want to recognize our 2007 lecturer, Ed Schofield. Ed was unable to be with us today due to a family conflict, but I want to thank him on behalf of Franklin Electric and NGWA for the commitment he put in in 2007 to this uh, educational series. It is my pleasure today to also introduce the 2008 McElhenney Distinguished Lecturer, Michael Krautkramer. Mike is Vice President and Principal Hydrogeologist at Robinson, Noble, and Saltbush, and has 35 years of experience in applying hydrogeological principles to the definition, development, and protection of groundwater resources. This work has required a partnership with the drilling industry that has endured throughout his career. Though most of his work is done in the Pacific Northwest, Mike has provided his professional services all over the United States, as well as in the international market. He's also active in the regulatory and political aspects of water resource management, providing expertise to many entities. These include, among others, the Washington State Legislature. He served for more than 15 years on the board of directors of the Washington State Groundwater Association and continues to serve on their legis legislative committee. The title of Mike's lecture is How Much is Enough? Making Decisions in the Water Well Industry. Today Mike will share the thought processes that evolved throughout his career and will discuss the aspects of making informed decisions that, and communicating them to the well owner. And with that, it's my privilege to introduce the 2008 McElhenney Distinguished Lecturer, Mike Krautkramer. Thank you. Well, this is finally happening. Uh, you, you guys have no idea how, how much you stress over this stuff when you're told a year earlier that you're going to have to give a, a lecture in 30 different cities. Uh, when I was first uh, asked to do this, I was, I was a little bit in awe of the honor of being named to be the McElhenney speaker. Uh, and then within about a minute and a half, I realized there are a certain amount of expectations that are, are going to arise with that, and uh, particularly with the quality of the speakers that have, have uh, done this before me. And uh, as I started to learn about William McElhenney, I, I realized it's not about honor to me, and it's not really about your expectations. It's about us recognizing uh, obligation to the industry that supports us. And uh, Bill McElhenney was the quintessential example of someone who gave his, his professional life to the industry and, and made things happen and was very interested in us teaching each other so that we could become better than the sum of our parts with regard to our industry. And it's in that spirit that I accepted the McElhenney Lecture Series and, and that I'm speaking to you today. So I, I hope that I can live up to what, what Bill McElhenney taught us. Uh, education within the industry and beyond the industry is one of the primary functions of the National Groundwater Association. Uh, the, the programs offered by the association, association in, include the National Groundwater Research and Education Foundation, uh, and that formalizes the education component, if you will, of, of the organization's function. Uh, the McElhenney series is uh, a part of that uh, effort. The selection process that uh, led to my being here, uh, I have to admit, somewhat baffles me in that I, I would not have seen anything selecting me to do this. But I, I have taken some confidence in the fact that the selection process in the past has worked well enough to where I was impressed with the previous speakers. So I'll just try and live up to that. As with all things, uh, 
there's a need to pay the bills. Uh, I'd like to thank Franklin Electric for supporting this, this program for the last two years and for the, for the year that I'll be serving as the lecturer. Uh, it, it takes a, a substantial dedication of both time and money for them to, to work with the organization in order to make this happen. Uh, their gracious contribution allows us to exchange ideas in a, in a way that, in my experience in the past, has been very effective and it allows a given speaker to go around to various venues and kind of give a, a singularity to the message of the organization for the year. Uh, so I, I'd like to thank both the staff with the National Groundwater uh, Research and Education Foundation and, and the people at Franklin Electric for making all of this possible. Uh, I was lucky enough to grow up professionally under the tutelage of, of several very good teachers. Uh, John Noble, who was my boss when I was hired and became my mentor very quickly and maintained the status of mentor even after I became his partner. Uh, and for that matter, even though he's retired, he still maintains that status as being my mentor, uh, is, is very much responsible for my career being able to grow the way it did. Uh, I was also extremely lucky to have contributions from drilling contractors like Ed Story and John Armstrong, Roger Olkey, and George Burke, who were the, the contractors that I worked with early on. And they were willing to take me aside, take me under their wing, as it were, and, and teach me how little I really knew about what was below my feet. When you come out of college, you pretty much know everything, and then eventually you realize how little you know, and that's when you become a valuable professional. Uh, those contractors really helped me to set a career path that worked well for my clients. Um, it is in, it's, it's their insights and the fact that I uh, have been exercising those insights for 35 years that makes me think that I've got something to say to you uh, today. When I started looking for what kind of a topic I would suggest for my lecture, uh, especially when I was informed that the context of the lecture was the construction of water wells, I was, I was immediately faced with the fact that I have never constructed a water well. Uh, and after that panic of that epiphany wore off, uh, I did realize that I have spent most of my career working on water wells and helping people make decisions. You see, I'm one of those guys that stands and watches you work, and uh, that makes me part of the industry, I guess. So at, at the risk of uh, exposing a little bit of a lack of humility, which, which when you're a consultant you're obliged to develop, uh, I suggest that I have become quite good at, number one, helping clients make decisions, and number two, uh, informing them about what the consequences of those decisions are, uh, and, and the communication of a decision is, is a, a pretty important thing with what we do. We believe we just go to that one. Uh, when we make decisions in the, in the drilling industry, those decisions fairly quickly become translated into steel and concrete. And it's very difficult and very expensive to change your mind. So we have to take our decisions pretty seriously and think them through before we impl implement them. Uh, very often early decisions can, can be uh, extremely limiting on the options that you have later in the project. And the order that we do things, and for that matter, the order that we learn things, is very critical to the su successful uh, execution of the project. Uh, this uh, relationship of things having to be done in the right order and you having to know things in the right order is called a critical path relationship. Now, now ours are, in every case, critical path projects. In short, that's just the awareness of knowing the order that you have to do things, making sure one thing is done before the next thing is started. Uh, you've been dealing with this concept all of your life. Uh, we just don't generally call it that. Uh, your mom taught you very early when you were learning how to dress yourselves, and presumably that was early for most of you. Uh, first you put your socks on, then you put your shoes on, and that's, that's critical path thinking. Uh, when we 
when we look at it in, in terms of a drilling project, it gets to be much more complicated than that. But it's still the basic concept that you have to be aware of, that, that certain things have to be done in certain order. It is, in fact, a worthwhile effort when you first start contemplating doing a project to run through that entire job in your mind before you even start writing down a drilling plan. Work your way from the very beginning to the very end. When you, when you get to those parts of the job that kind of give you that knot in your stomach about something could go wrong, my, my best advice is go with your gut. Uh, pay particular attention to those aspects of the job that make you nervous. Let the little voices talk to you. Spend a little time thinking about how you can approach that part of the job in a way that either avoids the problem you're afraid of or at least gives you a couple of ways out to recover from it without destroying the project in the process. Uh, the decision-making process that we have in, in a drilling project is, in fact, much like those maze puzzles that we did when we were children. Decisions have consequences. Uh, attention to those consequences very quickly uh, lead to a, a, a drilling plan that, that protects you and, and where one part of the plan leads to the next part of the plan kind of in, in a good fluid flow. Uh, in the case of our project, some of the avenues that you choose may very quickly lead to a dead end. Uh, when you're solving a maze, that's, you, you know, you can back up and, and recover pretty quickly. Uh, that's equally true with us. The, the lucky mistakes are the ones that lead to a, a no answer very quickly. Uh, in other circumstances, the results of bad decisions can in fact haunt the project forever and, and lead to an unavoidable consequence of ending up with a, an inadequate well, or in the worst case, an entirely failed project that you can't recover from. Uh, those are killers, and, and the waste of time and materials from a bad decision while you're doing the drilling plan can in fact be a very, very bad consequence throughout the entire project. Your decisions have uh, serious implications to the success of the project. You're, you're going to determine with your decisions how, how well you're able to reach the, the ultimate depth that the well has to get to. Uh, you're going you're gonna to determine how you're going to complete the well, what kind of pumps are going to be able to be installed, uh, how much production you can get and how efficiently you're going to get that production and, and whether you're going to end up with clean and clear water that's going to meet the, the customer's needs. Uh, the decisions also have serious implications to the business side of the project. That is, when you make good decisions and, and you have a successful project, you're much more likely to get paid without having to fight for it. Uh, Any time you end up in court is a bad day. Uh, if, you, if you make good decisions and you know how to make good decisions, you're, you're going to have less of those bad days. Uh, as you do good work, you build a good reputation. And uh, where I live, most of the drilling projects come to you from word of mouth. That's, that's particularly true in the domestic market. You, you end up getting work by doing good work. And, and so planning the project appropriately really does help you in terms of future work. Uh, a good set of decisions in a carefully thought out project will, will make you able to explain what it is you're doing and why you're doing it. Uh, that, that goes back to the getting paid, but it also makes for a much happier customer when they understand that, that there are decisions to be made and, and you share that with them. And finally, good decisions just save you time and money. Uh, so care in the decision-making process is, is worthwhile at both the project level and the business level. Good decisions are made based on, on, on good information. Uh, there are a great many places nowadays that we can get information about the subsurface. Uh, without a doubt, the best is if, if your state has a way that you can access the water well reports, the, the driller's logs that are, that are submitted, uh, looking at what other guys have, have uh, already seen is, is a good way to figure out what the subsurface is. Uh, in a more formal sense, the USGS does a great deal of work all throughout the United States and gives you some pretty good ideas of, of what the geology and the subsurface uh, strata are going to be. 
uh, they give you pretty good information about water levels and where a given aquifer is uh, likely to be uh, pumped from in terms of, of how much energy it's going to take to get the water out. Uh, they're also very good with water quality. So doing, doing the research is, is a, a good basic part of planning the project. Uh, don't skimp on it. And even when you get into the project and you find you're in trouble, stopping and doing some additional research can actually save you a lot more time and money than it costs you. So uh, I, I can't stress enough that, that getting smart before you start defining the project is, is worth doing. If you don't explain what it is that you're going to be doing to the customer, they're not going to know. And if you don't research the project enough to know what you're doing yourself, then, you know, then, then you're not going to know. And, and neither of those outcomes is a very good way to start a project. So the, the pre-design aspect of the project is, is a, a very critical time. It, it's a, a good idea to organize what your informational needs are. Uh, I suggest that a checklist so that you remember what questions to ask. Now maybe that's because I'm getting old and I tend to forget things. But a checklist keeps you doing things in, in kind of a dress right, dress manner. And, and that's a good way to maintain some discipline in setting up the project. While you're discussing the job proposal with the, with the pr prospective well owner, explain why you need to know the information that you're asking them. Take them along on the, on the design a little bit and, and explain to them how drilling plans are formed. Uh, that protects you a little bit against some charlatan coming in and underbidding you because they're, they're going to drill a well the wrong way and do it with smaller casing and do all kinds of things that you wouldn't advise. And that keeps from having to just uh, be beat by somebody who's just comparing dollars. In the event that the job turns into something different than your original plan intended, and, and many of them do, uh, it's also a good idea to, to have the customer informed of how you got to the plan that you, you've made. If, you, if you've documented the plan and you've communicated that with the customer, then when it comes time to change the plan, they'll understand what information you use to make that plan has turned out to be different and you can explain the change much, much better and they, they feel less put upon by, uh, by the bait and switch kind of thing. A very important aspect of, of making the drilling plan is to go out to the site. Uh, we, we have a, a thing called a, the prime directive in our company. It came from several years ago when, when one of our geologists had, had done a, a very nice drilling plan, but nothing was right because he didn't go out to the site. And while well, he was being rather loudly admonished by John Noble, the words that rang through the office were, go out to the goddamn site. And, and I would suggest that's, that's not a bad watchword for the industry. Uh, when you do your site inspection, if you can do it with the well owner, with the prospective owner on site, that's much better. And when you're out there, assess the logistics of what's going to happen. Uh, you have to think about uh, how you're going to get the rig on and off the site. And, and uh, I've worked in areas where, where freeze thaw and, and heavy rains can, can be an issue. And looking at the site the way it is the day you're walking it is only part of your job. You have to envision what is it going to look like when the ground thaws or what is it going to look like after you get two weeks of rain. And, and those are important things and you get a feel for it out in the field that you won't get by looking at a map and saying I know how to drive there. Uh, you have to observe where your cuttings are going to end up and is it okay to just leave them on the ground or is, is that customer going to want them removed? If he wants them removed, you want to put them in a place where you can collect them rather easily. Uh, where, where's you going to get, where are you going to get your drilling water? You know, just the logistics of having a, if you've got, you got to load the tank up at, the, at your shop, that's, that's fine, but you've got to know that and you've got to plan for that. If they're able to run hoses from the neighbor's yard or if you're drilling for a purveyor and you're, you're drilling right next to one of their big wells and they can give you a two inch line that feeds you all the water you want, those are things you want to figure in your drilling plan. Um, you have to ask yourself, uh, where is the pumping water going to go when I, when I do my pumping test? Is that going to become a problem? 
or you're going to have a lot of erosional problems that then put turbid water into a local, local stream and generally piss off the, the regulatory agencies. Uh, those are things you want to think of ahead of time, not have to face them while you're doing the, the pumping test. Uh, is the site legal? Do you, can you get the right setbacks? Uh, and even if you drill the well legal, when they get done doing what they're planning on doing in the future, are you going to have the right setbacks then? You have to talk to them a little bit about what they're planning on doing on the project site. Uh, you wouldn't be the first ones to have somebody decide they're going to put a septic tank five feet from your well after you've left the site. So you've got to make sure all of that stuff gets discussed. Uh, due diligence uh, during the site visit is uh, able to save you a great deal of, of headaches later on. Uh, if, if you're walking the site and you see that all the trees seem to have curved trunks, you might want to look at why that is, because it usually means the ground's moving. Uh, if, if you walk past a babbling brook and note how cute it is, remember that that's something that you're going to be expected to protect, and you have to have your drilling plan ready to do that. Before you even quote the job, there are, there are a bunch of decisions to make, and they, and they need to be made in, uh, with sufficient information to make them wisely. Uh, this is probably the most critical point in the project with regard to locking yourself into things that you're going to have to live with. It's always prudent to interview the, the customer about all of the issues for two reasons. One is so that you know what they want. Uh, and, and, and at the time you're hearing what they want, you also have to consider what do they need because most people want more than they need. And, and if you can figure out what's going to satisfy them, you can make a drilling plan that's going to ultimately lead to a success for that, that customer. I, I have a lot of people that think it takes you know, 20 gallons a minute to run a household when, in fact, two gallons a minute properly done will do a really nice job for them. Uh, so, so people have expectations that aren't necessarily correct. You want to get as much information in writing as you can while you're doing this process so that you've got a document you can go back to and show the customer and say, we were going over this before I started drilling. This is what we were expecting to get. Uh, th those become very important documents when, uh, when the job starts to become different than what was expected. Uh, when, when you're on the site, select a specific site that you're going to set the rig on. Actually drive a stake. And then after you've driven the stake, go back and check the setback issues and all that stuff one more time. If there are engineers and architects and other professionals that are involved in the project, Tell your customer to have them check that stake before you move the rig on the site. Uh, this, this site that I've, I've got pictured here was an extremely pretty place to go to work in the morning. But it was just a hell of a place to get an agreement of where we were going to drill the well. And, and we drove a stake, but by the time we moved the rig on site, the engineers and the architects and, and one of the regulators had us move that stake three different times. Now, it was quite easy to move the stake. I didn't mind. But it's a little tougher to move a rig, and it's damn near impossible to move a well. So, so get the stake in the ground and get everybody to agree on it. When you're developing your quotes, the fact that you have information isn't enough. You have to use that information in developing a thorough drilling plan. Uh, where possible, use unit prices. Uh, lump sums lock you into the guess at depth and lock you into the guess at quantities and it's just, it's the, the risk of how the site is going to dictate the project really ought to be the owner's risk, not yours. And so I, I stay away from, in our projects, I, I stay away from any kind of lump sums that I can and, and define things in terms of my best guess at how many units we're going to need and what the cost per unit is, and then if we need a different number of units, it's pretty easy math for the customer to accept. Uh, you have to research your prices. Uh, there's a tendency on all of our parts to use the price we used last time, and if you do that long enough, you're only guaranteeing yourself that you're going to be behind the times and you're going to give a price that is going to be less than what you're going to have to pay for the, for the, the product you're going to put down the hole. Uh, you want to keep notes on all of the assumptions that you're making and communicate those to the client. Uh, 
go over the proposal. Once, once you've got the quote, you've got the prices you're going to give them, go over that proposal with them so they understand what it is you're proposing and how that might be different from what another driller is proposing to them so that they're not thinking it's apples and apples when in fact it's an apple and a, and a prune. Uh, at the time you've, you've submitted a quote, you've got a drilling plan, you've, you've submitted a quote, you've already made a lot of decisions whether you know it or not. You're, you're locked into a, a great many things. You've decided how deep you're going to be able to drill because you you picked a, a drilling type of rig and, and which rig you're going to use. You've, you've uh, determined a casing size that you're going to drill with, and, and those inherently have a, a maximum depth you're going to likely reach with it. Uh, you've, you've decided uh, to eliminate some of your completion options by virtue of the casing that you've chosen and the method that you're using. Uh, you've put a top end on the amount of water that that well can make because the casing is only going to hold so big a pump, and that's going to limit how much water you can pull out of the well. At the very least, be aware that you're making these decisions. Don't, don't, uh, don't let your same thing, different day, get in the way of thinking your way through what it is you're doing. And make sure you understand that with this project, I'm limiting myself in this way. And then. Uh, Remember that you made those decisions as, as you go down the, down the route of the project. Um, if possible, inform your customer that those decisions are inherent in the, in the drilling plan and that those decisions carry implications and that you want to make sure they're comfortable with the implications. So now we've, now we've got a project and we're out, we're out in the field and we've, we're on the site, so we, we, we've got to decide a whole lot of other things as we go that we couldn't know when we're making the drilling plan. Uh, how deep you're going to drill, you, you may have an idea because you, you, you basically bid the job for a depth, but you have to make decisions on how deep you're going to set the surface can, how, how deep is the seal going to have to be in order to meet the state regulations, and in order to you know, protect the well from any kind of contamination in a real world situation in addition to the regulatory. Um, how are you going to complete the well? How much development are you going to use? How much testing is necessary? All of these are decisions you're going to have to make in the field after you get a little more information from the ground. Um, how much water are you going to tell the customer they can have? And that's, that's always a tricky thing because you want to give them a big number and be a great success. And yet, if they count on that big number and you've made it too big, then you become the goat later on. So you, you have to think your way through all of that based on what you've, what you've learned as you drill the well. And the final set of decisions that you've got to make is, is how much of that information that you generate during the entire project are you going to pass on to the customer? And, and I, I intend to discuss all of this in order and we'll start with uh, trying to figure out how deep you ought to drill. Uh, the most important thing when you're, when you're getting there is to, is to keep the mission in mind. You're there to make a water well, not a classy hole in the ground, and, and you're there to make sure that the customer gets what they need, not just to meet a schedule and get to the next job. So, so keep in mind you're trying to make water come out of the ground in quantities that will satisfy the customer's needs. It's not about getting done by Wednesday so you can go to the next place that you promised by Thursday. Uh, your research gives you some kind of a target depth, but reality is below your feet and you've got to drill it to know it. Uh, so observe everything you can. Uh, when you uh, start drilling a hole, Every one of them is different. I, I live in an area that we've got a, a great deal of unconsolidated material, and every, every bit of it's different from the stuff you drilled yesterday. Uh, there, there's just no two places in the Puget Sound region that, that you hit the same geology when you drill several hundred feet away, much less a quarter mile. Uh, so every day, in my opinion, every day on a drill rig is on the job training. Don't go out there thinking you know things. Go out there thinking you're going to learn things. Uh, watch the cuttings. Pay particular attention to uh, what color the water is and how the water levels respond while you're drilling. Uh, take proper samples. I can't stress that enough because 
when you get to where you're wondering if, if this is different than what I was drilling two days ago, uh, when you lay it side by side, you can see differences that you won't think were there when, you, when you're remembering what you drilled Tuesday and, and you're looking at something else on Thursday. The samples are really valuable to you in the field while you're making decisions about how deep to drill. Uh, and I like to uh, encourage the drillers that work for me to keep very good written records every day. Uh, remembering everything that happened through the week on Friday generally doesn't work that well. It is, in fact, a complicated world in which we work, and we've got to remember that those complications are ours to figure out. Now, hopefully, when you did your research for the, for the project and came up with a drilling plan, you were able to target a, a specific aquifer that you know about. But sometimes we just don't know what aquifer we're going to be finishing in. You have to uh, keep track of what you're drilling in, and it's probably worthwhile to keep well logs from the jobs that were done by others or by yourself nearby and look at those well logs every once in a while. See if your geology is matching what the other people saw. And if it's not, try and figure out why. Um, check the water quality info from the other wells so that you know that the guys that finished the well at that really nice gravel at 150 feet ended up having high iron and manganese. And, and it was a very expensive treatment to, to make the water usable for the, for the customer. If that's going to be an issue with your customer, you'll advise them to go to a next aquifer down, not to finish in that one. But you can know that stuff ahead of time by, by keeping track of, of the comparison of what's been done before you in that area and compare it with what you're seeing. Uh, you, you need to drill until you have enough aquifer to make the amount of water that you need. Uh, and and I, I can't explain that to you, and I, I probably couldn't explain your area as well as you already know it. But keep in mind that you have to drill until you can have sufficient material contributing water to meet the requirement that that customer is asking for. Uh, in addition to that, you have to have enough available drawdown in order to meet the laws of physics to get that water to enter the well. And so uh, probably the watchword is don't settle for just enough. Drill, drill until you've got a significant amount of saturated material with a great deal of water above it. Uh, in a confined aquifer, that can be uh, a, a fairly, uh, the, the water can snap up on you at 200 feet right after you get through the confining layer. But, but uh, you have to make sure that you've got available drawdown before you decide to bottom the well. Uh, the issue in determining how deep to drill is mostly about not closing doors that you don't have to close. Uh, the best rule of thumb is to drill the entire thickness of the aquifer. If the economics of the project don't get in the way of that, you're always going to be happier having drilled it all. If you only need a little bit of water and you've got this just boomer aquifer out there, then not drilling all of it may be just fine. That, that's a call you're going to have to make in the field, but for the most part, Stopping early turns out to be a bad decision. Uh, it's always, e even where, where you're only going to need a little bit of water for a domestic well, you have to remember that things change with time. Uh, a well that's just perfect today may not be quite so good during the dry season. It might not be any good at all during a drought. And if you didn't drill the extra 40 feet of aquifer and didn't give your, your customer that protection, then you really didn't make a very good decision for them. Uh, it's always good to buy a little insurance for them. Drill the aquifer when it's there. Drill a little bit deeper. Get yourself a little bit more available drawdown. Get a little bit more pump submergence. Uh, pumps, pumps work a lot better with more water over them. And uh, the extra footage that you're drilling them may, may be saved just in the fact they don't have to change out the pump two or three times additionally during the life of the well. So it's always worthwhile to give the, the option of having more aquifer to feed the well. 
Uh, the math of the drill the hole aquifer thing is, is pretty well expressed in this diagram, which comes from uh, Fletcher Driscoll's Groundwater and Wells. Uh, and Johnson Screen was gracious enough to uh, give me permission to use several of the drawings from that publication. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is, the less of the aquifer you use, the lower the percentage of the optimum uh, or maximum specific capacity that well can have is available to you. And that's mathematically prescribed. You can, you can be the best drill in the world if you only take 10% of the aquifer. You're not going to get more than you know, 20 to 25% of the potential production of that, that aquifer system. Um, when you get that additional drawdown that, that is implied by a lower specific capacity, uh, you're doing things that make the well more susceptible uh, through its entire life. You're going to have well losses that are much greater when you start out, and they're going to get worse with time. Uh, and the, finally, when, when we get to talking later about completion, if you haven't drilled it, it's pretty clear you can't screen it. Uh, now, now the, the, the mathematics of, uh, you know, why Penetrating the aquifer is important to get the water out. Really comes down to the fact that most of the stuff that makes water that we finish wells in, whether it's unconsolidated material or or uh, sedimentary rock, consolidated rock, uh, it's a bedded system. It was laid down in thin layers, and water moves much better through that system horizontally than it does vertically. Uh, water will move anywhere from 10 to 100 times better horizontally uh, along the bedding planes, then it will move vertically across the bedding planes. And when you don't penetrate the aquifer, you're making water move vertically. You're making it cross the bedding planes, and that costs you in efficiency. You have to develop enough pressure to overcome that friction loss that's needed to drive the water across the bedding planes. And it's just, it's, it's so starkly inefficient that nobody knowing that that's what they're doing, would choose to make the water go the hard way. And that, that's why I, I consistently through this speech will be telling you to drill all of the aquifer and to complete in all of the aquifer if that's an option to you. Uh, before we get into the next phase of the project, which is deciding on, on how to complete the well, I want to talk a little bit more about the, the well efficiencies and, and uh, how those affect how you might want to make your decisions with regard to completion. Uh, I'm going to revisit that, that curve that I was talking about, the, the partial penetration diagram, merely because the same arguments that were used about drilling it have to be used when you're talking about completing in the aquifer. If you don't give the completion, if you don't give the well an opportunity to move the water horizontally into the well, then, then you're, you're basically cheating your customer out of some of the efficiency that they have a right to. Uh, if you need all of the water that you can get, then you have to screen all of the aquifer that you have. And that's particularly true in the, in the confined aquifers, which is where most of our wells are completed. I would admonish you that it's very easy to get into a habit of kind of settling for what's good enough, you know, that ought to do it kind of thinking. And, and because we can't know how, how the aquifer is going to respond to either the withdrawal that we're having or the collective withdrawal that's happening all throughout the basin, uh, good enough today probably isn't going to be good enough 10 years from now. You're not doing anybody any favors by by settling for good enough. And I don't know many clients that, that ask me to give them just good enough. So keep in mind that, that when you're making completion decisions, you want to make as good a well as possible. You have to design the well to be efficient because less efficiency means more drawdown. And more drawdown puts much greater stresses on the well. You tend to get much more blockage. You tend to, at times, encourage chemical and biological problems by having excessive drawdowns in a well. So there, there are several reasons that 
you want to design for the optimum efficiency that you can afford. That is, you have to stay within your budget to some degree, but even if you've got to go back to the customer and say, I estimated five feet of screen, but I'd like to put 20 in here, that's worth, worth having that conversation. The reason that the uh, customer cares whether it's an efficient well is because the efficiency goes directly to the cost of operations and the reliability of the well through time. So if you, th if you think you're saving the customer money by, by going with a simpler design, in most cases you're not. Uh, a design that only uses a little of the aquifer results in, in all of the inefficiencies I've been talking about uh, earlier. The more drawdown means greater stresses, uh, and, and the, the suggestion that uh, you should save money at that time is probably not one that if you explained it to the customer they'd agree with. You have to consider not, not only the cost of pumping the well, which, which is physics and, and the cost of power, the, the deeper you're pumping from, the more energy it takes to move the water out of the well. Uh, the, the graph that I've generated here kind of shows that when you get to lower and lower well efficiency, you get to higher and higher drawdowns or, or much deeper pumping water levels. Uh, if you're only pumping a little bit of water, like a domestic well, the difference in pumping costs can be just a few hundred dollars a year. But when you get to where you're pumping a few hundred gallons a minute out of a well, the pumping costs that for, a, for an inefficient well, the, the added pumping costs could be several thousand dollars a year. Uh, when you compare to that in the fact that uh, that well is going to be pumped for 20 or 30 years, it's probably worth spending a little more money on the completion. Uh, spend the money on the well. Don't make the customer spend the money forever making up for the fact that you didn't. They're going to spend it either way. They might as well spend it up front and have the best product and the most reliable product. When we get to the actual decisions about well completion, you have to decide how much is it worth going after all of the water and, and am I going to be able to get this effectively done with a liner or should I use a screen? If I'm going to use a screen, is it, is it something I should consider gravel packing? How, how long a screen should I use? How, what type of screen? Uh, and, and how much of these costs are justified for the quantity of water that the customer needs to have and, and the reliability that the customer is going to expect from this, this product. When we're in consolidated rocks, there's uh, really only uh, basically three options that I know of. Uh, the first one is, is the leave, leave it alone, don't do anything to it, just let the well make water. And the, the uncased hole is in fact a very efficient way to get water to enter the well. Uh, the difficulty with the uncased hole is something that the old timers used to call the, the keystone rock. That's the rock that falls out of the upper part of that hole, right down on the, onto the pump or onto one of the couplings, and locks you in tighter than hell. And, and that's a risk that, you know, for the cost of a little bit of liner casing, your customer doesn't have to live with. Uh, so I, I don't usually encourage the uh, uncased hole as, as a product to give to a, to a customer. It, it's, a, it's a risk just, just waiting to happen. Uh, the next option is to put a liner in that's, that's just a slotted liner where it's either machine cut or, or torch cut. These are usually PVC or mild steel. Uh, that's a perfectly legitimate way to finish a rock well provided you're paying attention to the amount of open area you're giving the well and you're not building in inefficiencies that are, uh, that are going to cost the customer later on. If, if you have enough liner that you can put a lot of slots in and it's going to make enough water without causing a lot of extra drawdown to get the water to go through the slots, that's probably acceptable. There's another aspect to the slotted liner that you have to worry about, uh, and that is, is it is the material that you're putting in compatible with the chemistry that's going to happen in that well. Now that's, that's the chemistry of the groundwater and if the water is encrusting, if you've got really hard water for instance and you're going to go half, 
have to go back into that well every once in a while and treat it with acid, then if you put in a mild steel casing or something that's, that's not compatible with the acid that you're going to use, that's a bad design. Uh, finally, the, the, the most aggressive completion for a rock well would be to put a liner in with screens on it, with, with a stainless steel screen. And, and where you've got water quality issues, the stainless steel screen on the liner is, is a very good idea. If you've got a situation where you've got limited drawdown and you want to get the most efficient water entry into that liner, the screens are a good idea also. When we get to the uh, cased wells, which, which is uh, unconsolidated formations or, or loosely con consolidated formations, uh, there's always a temptation to do what is, you know, this is with domestic wells in my experience. There's the temptation to just leave it as an open bottom hole, with what the old timers used to call a barefoot well in my world. Uh, the, the quote from Einstein here that everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler, uh, I believe that the barefoot well is in fact the no simpler part. Uh, it, it's uh, never an effective way to finish a well in a way that's going to be stable for the customer. Uh, if you consider the barefoot well, it's, it's got a hole that is just a horizontal circle. And that is uh, a situation that makes gravity your worst enemy. Anything that falls down blocks that circle off. And, and through time, the sediments that accumulate on the bottom tend to block off the only open area you've given that well. And so it's really just a matter of time until the efficiency of that well goes down. Uh, that's an issue that it, it's just not appropriate to give your customer something that's going to go to hell in a handbasket. And the only question is when. Uh, so I never encourage anybody to use the open bottom. When we uh, talk about aquifers that are fairly prolific, coarse material, uh, perforating the casing can work very well. It works best when you're in a situation where you don't need to get all the water that you can because the perfs don't allow you a great deal of open area, but it's a way of making open area without having to invest a lot of time and money. And, and for lower production wells, it, it's a reasonable thing to do. Again, with this, this option, you have to pay attention to the water chemistry. If it's corrosive water, and those perforations are going to open up with time, then you've basically started the clock ticking that's, that's going to fail eventually. And, and you've got to keep the water quality in mind for that reason. Uh, the next step up would be the, the slotted liner. And a slotted liner is, is a poor man's screen. It, it'll allow you to expose the aquifer uh, over a, a large area. It gives you that horizontal flow that I was talking about. And that's a very good advantage to give to the client. Uh, the slotted liner has vulnerability in that it, it's, again, very limited open area. Uh, if the corrosivity of the water uh, is going to open those slots up, you have to be aware of that. Uh, and you have to pay attention to the, the size material because even the slotted liner, which is a much smaller hole than, than the perforator is going to give, is going to give an opening that material will want to run through if it doesn't made up with the, the slot size, doesn't made up with the aquifer material grain size. So you have to make sure that when you're using either the perforations or the slotted liner that you have coarse enough material that it's going to be held out by those openings. Otherwise, you've got a well that's going to make sand forever, or at least up until it collapses. Uh, screens, as a matter of just straight fact, add value to a well. A lot of us tend to think because you've got to sign that invoice and pay for the screen that the screen costs you. But it, it's a cost that, that brings more value to the project than it costs you in money. Uh, a screen gives you much better open area. It, it gives you much lower entrance velocities, which, which give you uh, the ability to produce the water with lower operational costs. The use of the screen gives you uh, control over many of the factors that tend to lead to well failures. And as such, they're, they're uh, a much more reliable completion. Though there are many types of screens, you, you can get the louvered, you can, you can get uh, any kind of material you want just about. 
I can tell you over 35 years, the only kind of screen I've ever put in a hole is a wire-wound stainless steel screen because when you get done looking at all it's going to take to get it there, uh, ordering it, getting it to the site, and all of the ancillary expenses of putting the screen and saving a few dollars on the material really doesn't make any sense. A stainless steel wire-wound screen is a very stable mechanism for holding the material out and letting the water in, and that's what the whole point of the project is. Uh, there are essentially two ways that you, you can screen a well. One is the direct screen method where you put in the, the telescoping screen, which has just a slightly smaller diameter than your drill casing, and, and you expose the screen to the formation by pulling the casing out. Uh, that's that's a, a very good method when you have relatively massively bedded material. Uh, it becomes less uh, effective if you've got really uniform sands. Uh, not that it wouldn't be effective if you got the screen right, but if you get the screen wrong, you'll never get the sand to stop. So it's a little more risky if you've got a really uniform sand. Uh, if you have layered materials where the layers have even subtly different characteristics, uh, the direct screen can be an issue uh, and, and you'd probably want to consider gravel packing. When you, when you make decisions about a direct screen for a completion, you also have to make decisions about how much tailpipe are you going to put on, how much riser pipe are you going to have, and uh, in my world we only use hydraulic jacks to pull back casing, but you have to make some decisions about uh, how you're going to expose the casing and what kind of control you're going to maintain. Uh, when we use hydraulic jacks, we can keep tools sitting on the screen and we can tell whether it's coming back or not. If you're using some kind of welded on knockback system or something like that, and the screen is coming back with you, you don't know till you're done unless you want to keep breaking it open and, and checking. So, so the, the, the reason for uh, hydraulic jacks is, is to protect against surprises. Uh, it also gives us a much more controlled mechanism for bringing the casing out. When we talk about gravel pack designs, that is without a doubt the, the Cadillac design, but in some cases, where, especially if you've got layering or if you want to preserve that bedding that I was talking about, the, even, even with a telescope screen, when you get done pulling your casing, you've got an annulus that's an inch or two that, that's going to have to have collapse happen in order to, to fill it in. And when that collapse happens, you're, you're destroying that natural bedding. So if, you, if you're counting on getting water out of a, a neatly bedded sand and you let all that sand just homogenize in that envelope right around the screen, you've got to either develop it very thoroughly to get back to the permeabilities that it had as a horizontally bedded material, or you're going to lose some efficiency. Uh, when you do gravel pack, you're, you're artificially filling that annular space, and that keeps that material from collapsing and maintains that horizontal relationship of the bedding. Uh, that, that makes uh, a gravel pack a much more efficient way to build a well in a, in a highly layered system. Uh, another aspect to layering is some of the layers are, uh, you know, a foot of gravel and then a foot of sand and then, and then a foot of, of yet different stuff. And, and where you have that kind of highly variable material and you want to put in a long screen, a gravel pack can, can kind of homogenize the, the screen design for you and, you and you can get a much better design that lets all of the water in without having to screen to the weakest link and, and have an extremely small slot size where, where you could otherwise use uh, something with a little better entrance velocity, I, excuse me, open area for, for uh, maintaining better entrance velocity. Uh, when, when you put a uh, a gravel pack well in, you have to have a riser assembly. In, in our wells, we use 40 to 50 feet, and that holds a reserve of the gravel pack so that if the gravel wants to settle through time while the well is operated, you don't end up running out of gravel. It also fills that annulus with something that will keep the water from transferring around the screen rather than going through the screen. Uh, when the water goes around the screen, there's nothing to stop the sand from coming in with it. Uh, the, the 40 to 50 feet is effective unless you're going to use excessive drawdowns in the well, then you may want something larger. The reason I bring this up is this goes back to what I was talking about in the beginning. 
you, you have to plan ahead. If, if you're going to take away 40 to 50 feet of the available drawdown because your riser is too small a diameter to house your pump, you've got to know that you have that drawdown to deal with. Uh, to give up that much drawdown in a well can be to give up an appreciable amount of production. So you've got to plan this stuff ahead if you're going to, if you think you're going to be working with a gravel packed situation, an aquifer where, where gravel packing is going to be appropriate, then you want to plan so that you've got a big enough casing when you land it to where you can put a gravel pack that will leave a riser with the ability to house the pump. When you, when you talk about making decisions in, in the completion of the well. Uh, the costs of inefficiency, and uh, I'll go over this a little, little quickly because it's, it's kind of a, a collection of things I've already said, but if, if you're short on available drawdown, uh, you, you, you don't have much drawdown to give, and, and your inefficiencies cost you some of that, then that translates directly into less production from the well. That's a pretty important consequence to deal with. Uh, if you have all kinds of drawdown, you're still going to have the issues of, a, you're going to have inefficiencies that cause you to have a much deeper pumping water level that goes directly to the cost of, of pumping and it goes to the reliability of the well through time. So design with efficiency in mind. Uh, the uh, kind of the best rule of thumb for, for the design process is, is to uh, remember that first you have to get a stable well. And, and, and if the well's not stable, then it's just, it's just problems waiting to happen. Uh, and then, then you want to get to where you have an efficient well. And only after you've accomplished those two in your design plan do you worry about cost. And then if it turns out that you came up with the right design, but it's got more cost than the customer wants to have, let the customer be part of that decision that they want to take some risks and save some money. But if you take the risks on your own, merely to meet a, a, a preconceived idea of what it was going to take to complete this well when you did your drilling plan, living with a guess is not as good as going to the customer and saying, let's do it the right way, it's going to cost this much money. In most cases, if the customer understands it, they'll go along with it. Uh, when we get to the next decision, we've now got a, we've, we've drilled to the right depth and we've completed with the most efficient completion. Now we've got to decide how we're going to develop the well. I think I'm getting feedback from two mics here. Uh, the, the, the development is a set of decisions that have to be made in the field. You, you can't, you can't pre-guess what it's going to take to develop. Um, proper development will, will lead to a stable well. It'll eliminate the, the sand production and the turbidity so that you can get clean and clear water out of the, out of the ground. Uh, I think that as an industry, we've kind of slipped into some bad habits with regard to development. I think we underdevelop a lot of wells now because it's, it's not as convenient to develop as it used to be. Uh, I, I don't know why that is, but underdeveloped wells very often lead to sand production, sometimes through the entire life of the well. And you can have a well that's making just a dandy amount of water and the customer's just able to pump all the water they want. If they're making a little bit of sand with it, it becomes a very bad experience for the operator of that well. And they end up cussing you out two years later, three years later, about why'd they, why'd they give me this well that's making sand? Uh, I gotta go and flush my system all the time, my, my irrigation is getting all plugged up, or whatever it is. And, and it's just not a good idea to, to stop short on development and, and leave something that, that's gonna ultimately make sand. Uh, underdeveloped wells are less efficient, and, and we've talked enough about efficiency being important. Uh, there's another aspect to underdevelopment that's really a problem for you more than the customer, and that is if you underdevelop the well and then you go in and you start running your pumping tests and the well develops as a result of your pumping tests, you're getting a mixed message from that well and you're going to end up overrating the well, or at the very least underestimating the amount of drawdown that's going to happen with time. Uh, so there, there are all kinds of reasons that, that development is important, and it's a much more important aspect of the job than 
than most of the people I work with admit to. I mean, we, we, we tend to overlook development as something that happens a little bit between completion and testing. Uh, there are a great many methods of development, and I certainly can't get into doing them, uh, you know, discussing them here. Uh, but uh, airlift, surgeon bail, and jetting kind of are, are categories of development that cover most of what we do. Uh, the, the, the standard, uh, put the tools in the hole and, and blow it with the, with the air rotary rig, is in fact a method of airlift, but it doesn't focus the energy very well. The, the, uh, the best rule of thumb for deciding how you're going to develop after you get done with the constraints that just the equipment you have put on you is, is to think of what has to be removed from the well, and that has to do with remembering whether you were carrying a big, a big slurry with you when, you when you hit the aquifer, you were drilling 400 feet of clay before that, and you, you got this just muddy mess that went down with you. If you've got to get that out, then you're going to want to pick something that's going to move a lot of water out. If, if it's something that's going to, going to need to remove sand or, or try and winnow out the fines right near the well, and that's the most important aspect, then you're going to use something like surgeon bale. But, but you know what's in that hole, you know what you've got to get out of the hole. Pick something that's going to put the right amount of energy into the right place and, and do it. Uh, the next aspect is how long do you develop? And the duration of development, uh, when I started out we were doing it for a couple of weeks. I, I worked pretty much cable tool holes and, and big diameter stuff and we'd start surging and a couple of weeks later we'd be done surging. Nowadays, it's something that's done for hours, and, and uh, I think there are a lot of inefficient wells out there because we've, we've stopped doing adequate development work. Uh, the answer is do it until you're done. Uh, that, that kind of begs the question of how do you tell when you're done, and, and for that, if you have the luxury of comparing a bunch of successive tests where you could, you know, if the water level is right up near the land surface and you could throw a ditch pump in, and say I'm making 50 gallons a minute with 20 feet of drawdown and then later you're making 50 gallons a minute with 10 feet of drawdown, you, you know that you're making a difference, you know that you're being effective. If it gets to where you're not making any more difference, then you're done. Uh, in other cases where, where the, you don't have the opportunity to get pumping information, observing the materials will, will give you a lot of clues as to whether you're done or not. Uh, save samples of the spoils that you, you are making early on so that you can compare them to later spoils, whether it's two hours later or two days later. When you lay them side by side, even though they, in your memory they all look the same, you'll find that the spoils tend to get coarser if your development is being effective. When you get to the, the ultimate, the, the last of it, you'll get to where there are a lot more flat pieces in the, in the, in the sample because you're getting to the sand that couldn't get through until it found the right direction to be in and come through the slots or come through the, the perfs. Uh, those are ways that you can get some insights into, into whether you're done or not. Uh, th there are significant benefits to proper development that make it worth the time and the expense of doing that. It leads to better wells with, with regard to efficiency. It leads to uh, a better stability of the well. Uh, I addressed the testing issues. Uh, if you misrate a well because you were, you were getting bad information, that's going to haunt the operator for a long time. Uh, you just get fewer problems with the well throughout its operational life if you've properly developed it. Uh, the next thing we're talking about is, uh, is testing. And it, it's easy when you, when you think about testing, the, the star of every test is, is the discharge line with all the pretty sparkly water coming out. And it's easy for people to start thinking about a test as if it's about water, but it's really about information. So you, you have to be able to project the long-term response of the well. Nobody's asking you how much water the well can make in an afternoon. They want to know how much water they can reliably take from that well and use for their purposes. <laughs> Uh, the ability to project those water levels, to project what the response of the well and the aquifer are going to be to a given pumping rate, can only be addressed through proper pumping tests and through good pumping data. Uh, 
there are two types of tests that have to be run on a well. The first one is the step test. That is pumping it at various rates, successively higher rates for very short periods of time and noting the specific capacity for each of those rates and seeing if that specific capacity is dropping off precipitously. Uh, if, you, if you have a specific capacity of five gallons per minute per foot of drawdown and you get to a certain point and it suddenly becomes 15 uh, or uh, two gallons per minute for, for a foot of drawdown, you, you've reached a point where that well has, has uh, lost the efficient ability to transmit water. You want to know that and you get that from the step test. Step test addresses the well loss issues. Uh, the second type of test is the, the constant rate test uh, where, we're, where we're at. They're usually a uh, Department of Health rules say that it has to be a 24 hour test. That's not true of domestic wells and, and with a domestic well you probably want to go at least four hours. Uh, the, the point of that test is to be able to project what the aquifer response is going to be through time. Uh, when we plot that data up uh, on, on what's called a semi-log sheet, and that's the, the graph on the left, uh, if the well is penetrating an aquifer that's relatively large in terms of its lateral extent and relatively consistent in the kind of material it has, the data that you collect during the test will make a straight line on this, on this kind of, a, of a, a plot. And you can project that straight line out and, and determine what the drawdown would be in that well at that rate for uh, a 10 day pumping period or a 100 day pumping period. And, and those are important things to use during the, the rating of the well. Uh, when you can take water level data in close order, and that's, that's best done with some of the electronic gear that's available now, transducers and data loggers are available to you at $1,500, maybe $2,000. And it's the thing to, to consider investing in because you can throw those things in the hole and they'll give you the water level every minute through the test. Uh, I put the graph on the right up so that we could discuss that Number one, that type of data set is a very good data set to work with. You know what's going on in the well. And number two, you don't always know what's going to happen during a test. Uh, this particular plot is interesting because about 10 minutes into the test where that, where that downward spike happens, we had an earthquake happen within 30 miles of the well we were testing. And it, it did significantly change the characteristics of the well. Uh, if we weren't taking close order data, we wouldn't have been able to see how that well responded to the, to the, to the earthquake. Uh, so you, you never know what's going to happen and it, it's a good idea to, to get as close an order data as you can. Uh, when you get to rating the well, it's really a matter of determining how much drawdown there is available in a practical sense in that well. And then considering all the factors that are going to use pieces of that drawdown. You've got the well loss information from your, your 24 hour test. You know that in 24 hours at that rate, you're going to use so many feet of drawdown. You can turn that into a specific capacity and, and find out at what rate you're going to use the amount of drawdown you think you have a reasonable expectation of getting out of that well. Uh, in addition to that, you have to take the projected water level that I was talking about as, as uh, the 10 day and 100 day projections and add that drawdown as, as part of the total drawdown that you're going to use for your design. There are other factors that you have to consider like the seasonal fluctuation of the water table. There are places where water tables will fluctuate 10 to 20 feet seasonally. If that's going to happen in your well, you have to make sure you account for that when you're rating the well. Uh, and the last issue is you may have interference from other wells. If during the, the process of developing and, and observing water levels through the the week or two up to the test gave you all kinds of different static water levels in the well, there's a good chance you're having interference from some well somewhere nearby. Uh, you have to account for that and then you add up the well losses, the aquifer losses, the seasonal losses, and interference losses and that total comes out to equal the amount of drawdown that you think is appropriate for that well. And then you find what discharge rate gives you the right numbers for those, those cumulative components to add up to the, to the amount that you're going to say you can pump. If you don't account for one or two of these components, 
if you don't project the water level out through time, then you're going to tell the client that they have water that they really don't have. Uh, now, I didn't mention the, the uh, aspect of recovery in, in, uh, in the testing procedures phase. Uh, you have to take as good a recovery data as you do drawdown data. Uh, the recovery is as important to the operation of the well and in some cases more important to the interpretation of the aquifer. Uh, if the recovery doesn't come fully back to where you started within about the same amount of time that, that you were pumping, if you ran 24 hours, then 24 hours after you shut off, it should be somewhere near static water level. If it's not, you should be worried about that when you're rating the well. Rate the well with a little more caution because there may be some other losses that you're not aware of. If the recovery is substantially less than the full static water level, you've got an issue that is beyond the well hydraulics. It's an issue of the budget of the aquifer. You've overcome how much water that aquifer gets for recharge in the area you're taking the water from. You have to resolve that before you can talk about rating the well. So, so it's, it's not just about what you saw in the test. You have to look at the recovery too. Uh, the, the aspect of, of testing uh, also includes water quality testing. And in order to do that correctly, you have to talk to the lab, make sure you've got the right containers, talk to the customer, make sure they, they know or, or someone knows what they need in water quality information in order to use the well. Each well is a little different. Uh, each customer's use of water is a little different. If you're always drilling irrigation wells, you kind of know what the irrigators need. If you're always drilling uh, domestic wells, you kind of know what, what the domestic owner needs. Even in a domestic well, water quality is critical. The lenders look at water quality when they're talking about whether you have an adequate water supply to get the loan for your house that you want to build. So, so water quality is important. You take that water quality sampling at the end of the constant rate test after you've pumped the maximum amount of water you're going to withdraw from the well. That makes the water more reliably representative of the water quality of the aquifer. The last part I wanted to talk about, and I'll, I'll try and get through it quickly, is, is how much information you should deliver to the customer when you're, when you're done. And, and uh, if, you've, if you've made these decisions predicated on information all the way through the project, and you've, you've followed this, this kind of rule of decision making, you're going to have a great deal of information at the end. Information has value to your customer. It has value to you and it has value to other drillers in the area. So that information is, is a, a critical aspect of what you're delivering to your customer. The well owner needs that in order to uh, properly operate the well. They're going to need it to work with regulators who ask them questions about their wells. They're going to need it in order to convince their lending agents that they have a bona fide source of water for the, for the proposed construction. Uh, I recommend the use of a three ring binder to organize that information. Uh, you have the ability with that to, uh, to give the client a tool that they can go to every time someone asks them a question about a well and they can have that with them at a meeting and, and it's just something that gives them a very good sense of having been well served by your your company when you did your job. Um, in addition to that it can be some fairly good marketing. If you put your company logo on the on the cover of that book and on the back binder of that book every time they reach for that book they remember you. Every time they take that book to somebody else and talk to them about the well whether it's a lender or a regulator or just a friend who wants to drill a well themselves You've got your company logo right out there in the face of people who are actually interested in who you are. Uh, so it, it, it's worth putting a, a substantial effort into delivering the information at the end of the job. Uh, you're giving them a well, but if somebody gave you a, a fancy piece of electronics and didn't give you the manual on how to operate it, you'd be a little pissed off. A lot of well owners don't even know they need information about their well until long after you've left. And then they go into a meeting and start getting a bunch of questions and they don't have a clue how to answer them. And they feel intimidated and they're, they're not having a good experience. If you give them that three ring binder, 
they've got something to work with, and, and that's, that's just worth a great deal to them, and it's a good way to, to leave your name behind with, with a, a marketing effort. Uh, when you consider what the client might need in order to meet regulatory, uh, it's something that you should do a little bit of research. Know what the wells in your area are going to have to face with regard to uh, wellhead protection plans or, or construction uh, uh, standards that are going to have to be demonstrated by the owner before they can get pumps installed and things like that. Uh, it, it's certainly worth knowing what the client's going to need and then trying to organize the information you've got from the project into something that'll serve those needs. Uh, we're finally to this part called summary. Uh, be before you quote a job, research it, plan it, uh, and, and make sure that you've done the whole job in your head so that you've got an idea of what you're going to be facing through the whole project and you can make decisions predicated on the whole project rather than doing it day to day. Uh, drill as much of the aquifer as you practically can. Complete as much of the aquifer as you practically can. And when you're making your design, design for maximum efficiencies. Uh, develop until it's done, even if it takes more time than you had initially anticipated. When you test the well, test it sufficiently. When you report the results, report them thoroughly. Report them in a way that's organized so that others can get at the data, so that others can see what the test said. Uh, when I talked about the, uh, the step test, that is, in fact, the best benchmark you can have for how a well is performing 10 years later or 20 years later. Somebody can go and do the exact same step test and see whether they're getting the same result or whether they're getting a much less efficient well. And then you know whether you should go in and redevelop or not. Uh, and so, so that's a tool that, that you're giving the, the client that they can use through the entire operational life of the well. Uh, share all of the information that you can. Give it to the client in a way that's going to be understandable to them. They don't know anything about wells. You have to explain it to them and you have to make it kind of intuitive in their heads as to how to use that book that you're going to give them. So be careful when you're doing it. Finally, if you make good decisions and you keep yourself properly informed and make those decisions from an informed platform, you're going to make good wells. And when you have good wells, you have happy customers. And when you have happy customers, you have good business. So I, I, I think that the concept of thinking your way through the project ahead of time and following that plan and doing decision making as an organized and intentional process will work well for your business. I really thank you for the opportunity and, and the honor of being the, the McElhenney lecturer for your organization. Uh, I have put my email out here if there are questions or, or you want to, uh, to discuss stuff in something a little more private than this room. I'm certainly willing to answer anybody that emails me. Uh, I intend to have the, the, the lecture slides available on our, uh, our web page for the company, so I gave you that. And the important thing for all of you looking for continuing education credits is the, the magic code is DW07008. Uh, in addition to me wanting to get feedback, uh, the Groundwater Research and Education Foundation is also interested in hearing from you both about this presentation and in general about how you think they could, they could help in, in educating both the public and the members of this organization. They can be reached at the address here, the uh, Westerville, Ohio address, or they can be reached by email at the ngwref at ngwa.org address. And with that, let's open it to questions. Or not. <laughs>